Welcome to Unlike, the unlikely intersection where intent, impact, and inquiry inspire our conversations. I am Dr. Terry Jackson, and I'm with Dr. Philip Brown. And what's interesting, we all experience intersections daily. We experience intersections at work, at home, at church, and at play. How we handle those intersections will determine the trajectory of our day and our life. Glad to have you back on as an audience here at Unlikely Intersections. And Dr. Brown, it's always a pleasure to have these conversations with you. This is going to be a very interesting topic today because we're going to speak specifically to our region. However, this is happening across the globe, right? So what we discuss today very possibly be, could be solutions to help the world, not just our particular area. And our topic today is food is medicine. And I know that you're just excited and can't wait to get into this particular topic. Well, it's, it's really near and dear to my heart. Food is medicine. Number one, I love to eat. Uh, number two, I really believe in, a, in my professional career as a vascular surgeon, it really couldn't have been if folks were eating a really good diet, mm. right? Like, so it's, it's very interesting paradox to me that, you know, a, a livelihood is created off people eating poorly. Mm -hmm. But then you got to peel that back, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it, I don't say it to be critical, right? Like I'm not criticizing people's dietary selections because I don't always know what their choices were. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of today's show. Mm -hmm. The concept of food is medicine is broad because it takes us everywhere from people not having access to food to eat to eating healthy mm -hmm. and all the benefits of that and really everything in between. But I want to set the context mm -hmm. by talking about North Carolina. So if you looked at North Carolina's GDP mm -hmm. and put it on a world stage, mm -hmm. North Carolina would be ranked number 30 in the world. Mm. And the strength of our economy is agriculture. Mm -hmm. So this global level state economy based on agriculture, yet we have a 20% childhood food insecurity rate across our state on average. That's a paradox that's hard for me to reconcile, right? Like 20% of the kids in our state don't get enough to eat on a day-to-day -day basis or have some, and adults are not immune either, particularly when you get into elderly populations and isolated populations. But that's amazing. Mm -hmm. It really and truly is amazing because a multitude of things run through my head, right? Um, <clears throat> having grown up in Wilmington, as, and it, it, if I examine Wilmington now, I take a look at where grocery stores are and where they're not, right? And I ask myself, how did how did that happen? Right. So I go to policy, whether it's local government policy, whether it's the the company who decided to build their grocery store in a particular area versus a, another area, right? But it it all comes down to to policy, um, and those people who make the policy. But at the end of the day, it's the consumer or the families that are impacted because. The healthy food is just not available to some people and it's available to others, right? And so we talk about food being a medicine and you being a physician. You know, if we ate properly, we would probably we probably wouldn't have to see the physician as often as we actually uh do. And you know, <clears throat> I did a little bit of research on that whole phrase, quote food is medicine. So I, I really wanted to find out where that originated because so many people talk about how it originated with Hippocrates, right? But in my research, I found a little bit something different that actually is attributed to a gentleman who was an ancient Egyptian named Imhotep. And this was written in the Edwin Smith Papyrus book, 
written over 3,500 years ago and actually was a 1,000 years before Hippocrates was born that Imhotep made that statement that food is medicine. And I wanted to do the research because we did a we did a uh, episode on the whole truth, right? And so we we need to understand the origins of where the whole truth come from. And I know people have to understand that to understand that let food be your medicine and how we are going to address that whole um, whole truth and how we are going to address food deserts in this area and hopefully across the globe. Yeah, it definitely didn't start with a Twitter hashtag, right? (laughs) Although you see it a lot now. And I I think it does help bring awareness, right? So the power of social media to bring awareness. uh, And we used used the hashtag food is medicine a lot uh, in the capital campaign for the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. Raised uh, many millions of dollars for that Mm -hmm. new building and everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, But... But the truth is that food is medicine. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you, as a, as a person who made a living as a vascular surgeon, there are only a very few health behavioral changes that we need that really would fundamentally change everything. Mm. One of those is certainly food and how we handle our relationship with food, not only the amounts we eat, but what we eat. Mm-hmm. And then the others, you know, really would be smoking and exercise. Mm-hmm. But if those things were in place, nobody would need a vascular surgeon. I mean, very few, right? Health mm-hmm. health would be incredibly better, particularly diabetes, which we'll get into mm-hmm. a little bit later. Um, but I'm always, I, I continue to be struck by people just fundamentally not having enough to eat, mm-hmm. especially children. Mm-hmm. And we have multiple nonprofit organizations just in our small town, but we know it's across the country mm-hmm. uh, that are working on this problem of not enough food to eat. So how's a child supposed to learn in school? How are they supposed to behave in school if they're mm-hmm. just literally starving to death during class? You know, how do we compensate uh, for that? Mm-hmm. phenomenon how do we recognize it uh, how do we measure it mm-hmm. how do we know if we're on track to fix it but one question that never comes up for me anymore but i hear a lot is how much more do we need to prove before we start really taking massive action around this problem of food insecurity you know absolutely you know i, I never would have thought that in 2022 in the United States of America that we'd be talking about food deserts and food insecurity. I remember the first time I ever heard the phrase food insecurity, and I really didn't know what it meant. It was probably 2011. I traveled to Washington, D.C., to the Liberian Embassy, and I was given a presentation. And a gentleman started talking about food insecurity, and I thought he was talking about security, like security guards guarding food because people in Liberia would you know, try to break in and get the food. And then he started talking about the pricing of food on the world market. And he made a very profound statement that really stuck with me. And his statement was, I just want to be able to wake up in the morning and know that my children can eat because there's food in the refrigerator. And it didn't, it really didn't hit me And then I come back to Wilmington, and I'm beginning to hear all this conversation around food deserts. And then I look across the country, and there are food deserts, right? And I'm like, wow, this is a serious issue. And I'm trying to understand how, in the wealthiest nation in the world, that we have an issue with people getting something healthy to eat, especially with the food that's thrown away by some of these major grocery stores. So I know you're going to get more into that because I know that this is a part of your your purpose as well as you're passionate about it. Well, you know, it gets to the definition of food desert, right? So in, in North Carolina and the way we've chosen to define it uh, in the dashboard, the Healthy Communities NC dashboard, is a food desert in a rural area is would be a a place where it's more than 10 miles to a food source Mm -hmm. and in an urban setting, that'd be one mile Mm -hmm. Uh, has to do with transportation patterns and what it takes to actually get access to the food and so forth. Um, And we know in Wilmington that 
we've actually experienced some expansion of food deserts. We know that COVID made things worse. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but a lot of it is stable. So you take Wilmington's North side where we're sitting right now. Uh, and it's been 30 years mm -hmm. since a grocery store was here. Now, now, fortunately, after a number of years of focused work, and we really started this in the health system in 2017, looking at the concept of food as medicine, looking at food deserts, focusing on food for our patients as well as our community. You know, now five years later, we know that there actually is going to be a North Side Food Co-op mm -hmm. just a few blocks from where we sit, first mm -hmm. one in 30 plus years. And mm -hmm. that's a collaborative partnership with many stakeholders, including our government, mm -hmm. uh, the New Hanover County government. So we're on the right trajectory in this particular community, but we have to continue to maintain vigilance about what's happening because as patterns change, the food desert can just move around That's right. based on the particular pattern that you're facing. And so we, we have to, we have to stick with that because the, the benefits of, of healthy eating cannot possibly be overstated. You know, it's very interesting because I know probably over the last four to five years, there probably have been five or six different grocery stores that have come into the Wilmington area. You look at Lytle, you look at Aldi, and you look at Publix that's open a couple of locations. But as they've entered this, 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 this area, not one, not one has built a store in what we consider to be a food desert, which is quite interesting that four to five grocery stores would come to this area, but not, and and of course their 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 obligations to their stakeholders, right? And that is to make a profit. But we can make that profit and be social and empathetic at the same time, right? Social, I guess you would call it social capitalism. But not one of those grocery stores made it to the food desert to the north side. Um, and that that was just quite quite interesting for me. Yeah, me too. And I, I don't pretend to, to understand the business model of, of food chains and, and grocery stores and everything, but I certainly understand that there are likely to be policy options that could be exerted to help make sure that these profitable entities participate in solving the problem across the whole community, yes. right? So not just come in and, and take out based on their model of commerce, but be a member of the community, participate. And we know that works because one of our great partners in this whole battle against food insecurity has been Food Lion, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. Food Lion actually has been a partner with us in food insecurity the whole time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of what it takes to solve it. Yeah, I, I would agree. It, it takes collaboration, co-creation, right? New ideas, curiosity, how can we develop, how can we take an existing model, modify that model, and make it uh, a model such that we can utilize in different areas, right? And it, it could have taken a conversation around publics coming to town because I knew people knew they were coming to town. How can we modify that model, whether it's a smaller version of a public store, a smaller version of a Lytle and Aldi? Um, and, and I know that when I named those particular they have a demographic they want to appeal to, right? They, you know, uh, and, and so I understand that. But again, when we're talking about human beings and we're talking about healthy food, uh, I would like to think that some of those models could be, uh, and we don't control that, could be uh, modified such that everybody can benefit. Well, in the world where, you know, you have Amazon's doing drone deliveries and mm -hmm. partnership, their ownership of Whole Foods and, and different things like that, it really does open up new opportunities in terms of what the brick and mortar infrastructure might need to look like in a given community and how that food may be able to be delivered in different ways. But the point is that we need to acknowledge that it's not a uniform situation. And I, I want to uh, get our engineer to point to 
the food hardship index in the region slide as we go through this next little bit and put that on because what you see is that you're going to see that in New Hanover County, the smallest geographic county in North Carolina, we have food indexes that range from the highest hardship index, which is 1.0. That's the highest you can get. It's like wow. making 100 on a test. Wow. To zero. Mm -hmm. And we have everything in between across those communities. And you can look at this map uh, that you see on your screen, and you can see by color what the level of hardship is. Mm -hmm. And as we go through different episodes on different economic hardships, one thing you're going to see is that there's a lot of similarity mm -hmm. between communities. So you see, mm -hmm. you see what's reflected based on concentrated poverty. And so, for instance, New Hanover Track 110, which has the highest hardship index for food, mm -hmm. also has similar findings in terms of housing stress and, and many other factors. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that that census track is going to be served now by one of the new Michael Jordan family mm -hmm. medical clinics of Novant Health's mm -hmm. being right in that census track. That is going to help actually eliminate that food desert because just four blocks from that clinic and really uh, inside a mile from, from these communities is going to be the fresh food market uh, mm -hmm. that's part of Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina's new building on Greenfield Street. Yeah. So we sort of start working on problems together, right? We bring access to health care to a neighborhood that doesn't have it. We bring access to food to the same neighborhood that doesn't have it, and on and on about all these other factors. Yeah, that, that's, that's, um, that's going to produce a lot of fruit in that area. Uh, Pardon the pun, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you you got the, 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 the health care and now the food, right? And so, as we say, food is medicine. So that's going to produce a lot of um, fruit, a lot of um, great outcomes in that area. And now, as you mentioned, based upon where we're sitting, you know, the fact that there will be a food co-op coming this way, that'll produce uh, even more fruit. So what we have to do is begin to transform the minds of the people around how they eat and what they eat. Uh, I'm just as guilty, you know. From time to time, I just got to have that two-piece white meat, french fries, and a large sweet tea, right? <laughs> when I probably should be doing a salad with some <laughs> grilled chicken or something, right? So not that we are perfect, but the fact that we are aware, making people aware of how food serves as medicine. You know, one of the things I, I, I mentioned to certain people on a, on a regular is when you're eating, you're really eating for nutritional value. What's the nutrition in which you're eating, right? Some people may go to fast food and you ask yourself, so what's the nutrition? Are you getting cellular nutrition when you eat that particular food? Or if you're eating certain food and you're not getting any nutritional value, all you're getting is filler, so you feel full, but from a nutritional perspective, you're not getting anything. And I think that's a part of the whole educational process, right, of food being medicine. And you can elaborate more on that. Absolutely. You're talking about, you know, empty calories versus calories that contain all the necessary nutrients and everything. And I got to tell the story of how this whole picture can come together sometimes, right? So one of the things that happened in, in 2017 uh, with our health system is that we really started looking at the concept of food insecurity and its connection to malnutrition. And we, we were really thinking through like, so how do we identify people in the first place that, that are either malnourished or don't have enough to eat? And so we thought, okay, captive environment, right? So our hospital is a captive environment, mm -hmm. right? So we can ask questions that help us know as just a part of the normal intake of any patient who, who gets admitted to our hospital. And if those two simple questions are suggestive, then a more thorough uh, diagnosis can be made. And, you know, we found out we have a significant malnutrition problem amongst hospitalized patients. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, we know that that's bad because they won't recover from their illness as well. Mm -hmm. They'll stay in the hospital more. 
They'll get readmitted more after discharge because their needs are not being met. The nutritional needs to heal whatever disease process or surgery that they had Mm -hmm. is not what it needs to be. And so we tapped into subject matter expert, our registered dietitians, Mm -hmm. and they started a malnutrition program and the results were incredible. Number one, our accuracy in diagnosing malnutrition based on the program that our dietitians established went up by 1,500%. So we were better at diagnosing it, right? Our readmission rate went down by 26% for these patients that were treated. Mm -hmm. That by itself is amazing, but the truth is we were given safer and better care. Mm -hmm. And then we began to realize, well, there are lots of gaps in that continuum of care that we really don't understand what really is going on in the homes and how do we give some of these patients the best opportunity for success? And so we did a pilot that was grant funded out of the Duke endowment and had a community dietitian on our staff. Mm. And that community dietitian for these patients that were screen positive would go into the home, help them navigate what to eat, how to eat it, and also get a little bit of a home assessment on other health-related features to plug into other different home-based services that we had. Mm -hmm. But it was truly amazing. So this became an anchor of a strategy for how you take care of people where they are Mm -hmm. in the home, right? And the results were amazing, as I said before, what the changes in outcomes were. But that was just for that one group of patients that was malnourished at the time of their acute illness. So we said, well, what does the rest of the continuum look like, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we began to screen for those questions in our outpatient clinics, right? And find out, okay, well, these patients are at risk for not having enough to eat or their families are. And we began to partner Mm -hmm. with Food Lion and Food Bank to have food box prescriptions. Mm -hmm. So these patients who would come into the clinic would be assessed for food security and if they had needs they would get a two-week prescription for food that came in a box Mm -hmm. and that was the bridge to connect them to other services that are already in existence for how they would then stabilize their food supply Mm -hmm. and not just something to eat you know these boxes got tailored by our dietitians to be healthy sources of food. And so you see how we really began to change the curve, but that wasn't the only thing because the malnutrition uh, quality improvements that we achieved were noticed. And us and another health system actually testified in front of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Mm. earlier this year. Uh, And in August, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced a policy change. So for the first time in history, they have included a quality reporting measure on malnutrition in the acute care setting, Mm. based in large part on our work and some of our partners in this malnutrition quality improvement initiative. And to me, that's really, really powerful because it it shows, you know, we've talked about evidence before and how you Mm -hmm. establish it. Mm -hmm. So that work led by our dietitians, you know, not led by doctors, not led by nurses, goes to show how complex the system is. But these experts mm-hmm. in nutrition mm-hmm. led a program that now has led to the reporting rule for all the acute care facilities in the country to change, to take into consideration what it means to make sure that your patients have the right nutrition to recover from their illness. Now, I had mentioned earlier, I said, hey, we're going to have this conversation and there'll be solutions provided not only for the local area, but across the country. And you just made reference to policies that were changed as a result of the work that was done here around malnutrition and how it could benefit the greater good of everybody in this country. And with food being our medicine, One of the challenges um, that I have seen just based upon family members who have, you know, gone to visit doctors is you talk about the nutritionist, right? But it's not 
on a regular basis that a nutritionist gets involved in the conversation. If food is going to be our medicine, how can we get more nutritionists involved in the day-to-day process of medicine in this area simply because that's the direction that everything is going. Healthy, The healthier you are, the healthier you're eating. So that's the less medicine. But how can we get that nutritionist around physician offices to be more involved in the conversation to dispel some of the myths that some of the people, how they eat, they might think it's healthy, but it's not healthy, and they really need to hear it from a professional. And often the doctors don't talk about it. That's right, and and the doctors aren't the aren't the most informed profession, right? It really is the registered dietitians. I can tell you what we've done, uh, you know, in in Novant Health and New Hanover Regional, is this community dietitian that we had on a pilot program really just became a regular part of our our employed staff Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and is central to so much of what we do in the food space because as i mentioned earlier it takes community partners to really solve this problem of food insecurity and so uh, this person has become a resource Mm. of expert information right of how do you you know maybe a community nonprofit is trying to work in the food space and they want to have better information about what that diet, what a healthy diet looks like, then our dietitian is that expert, right? Okay. And so we, we see, as we see more of that, you know, we recognize that there's a need for involvement, you know, beyond just the acute care setting and beyond the post acute, uh, go home setting. It's how about sooner, mm-hmm. right? You know, you, you learn, I used to teach PE and health in my first career before I was a doctor. And, you know, you teach basic dietary things at that level, but that doesn't really stick. Mm-hmm. You know, what tends to stick is when people can participate in the whole continuum of, you know, sometimes growing the food. So we have community gardens mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all the way to harvest, to food preparation, cooking, so we do that as our health system, Novant Health, has two mobile kitchens. Mm-hmm. We can teach cooking. And mm-hmm. several of the area nonprofits have commercial teaching mm-hmm. kitchens mm-hmm. as well. And so, you know, you begin to try to initiate culture change mm-hmm. based on education and opportunity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it becomes possible. You create a different future. Mm-hmm. But it does take time. It takes stamina. Yeah, it does. Because I was just thinking, as you were saying, you know, for those, especially the census tract that you'd mentioned where you're going to place one of the, they're going to place one of the Michael Jordan clinics. And if that's one of the most uh, economically challenged census tracts in the state and in the the country, how do we have a continuous educational process around what healthy eating looks like? right, the proper types of foods, um, because that's where that malnutrition, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is, is happening. And then there are people who, who can afford it and still eat in a very malnutritious way, right? And I'm probably one of them. <laughs> but uh, that whole educational process of, for those who may not know, for me, I know, I just choose differently sometimes, but for those who may not know at all, how do, how do we begin that whole educational and culture change process, as you mentioned? Well, that's a fascinating question, and it really makes me think of uh, a little over a year ago, former Surgeon General Dr. David Satcher came to Wilmington and Mm -hmm. did a lecture series, and he's written a book on on health equity and, and what that means, and, you know, food security is a big part of that. But he talks about really four things. You know, and the first one is, do mm-hmm. you care enough? Mm-hmm. Second one is, do you know enough? Mm-hmm. That means a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Third one is, do you have courage? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. finally, the fourth one is, are you willing to persevere to see these initiatives through? Mm-hmm. And so the first question we really have to ask, so you look at, uh, in the case of uh, New Hanover County, just by way of example, 
you know, a coastal community that has a food hardship index of zero Mm -hmm. versus an inner city community that has a food hardship index of 1.0, which is the hardest you can get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do enough people care? Right. Uh, You know, certainly some of us do. We've demonstrated that. We uh, have an organization who partnered with Cape Fear Collective to create a similar index that determined where the Michael Jordan Family Medical Clinic went, as well as the other one, which is going in East Wilmington, based on a very similar index. So, mm-hmm. you know, there is the beginnings of a critical mass mm-hmm. of folks who care enough and who are acting into that. You know, the food organizations in our community, mm-hmm. whether you talk about the food bank, whether you talk about uh Nourish NC, whether mm-hmm. you talk mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. Mother Hubbard's Covered, lots of faith-based organizations do food-based programs. Mm-hmm. You know, that is, to be, to use a biblical term, since I mentioned churches, that's, in a lot of cases, that's giving a person a fish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What you're talking about mm-hmm. is how do you educate people, how do you teach people to fish? Right. Fundamentally different thing. Um, and that does get into stakeholders, right? So, mm-hmm. You know, we've got this dietitian that's an expert that can help. It's not enough. How do you get the school system involved? Mm -hmm. How do you get more community-based organizations involved in really understanding how to change that? How do you get governmental agencies involved so that we can have more community gardens? Mm -hmm. I mean, every community could have gardens. Just about in in Wilmington, there are places because they're – ways to do rooftop gardens, there's Mm -hmm. using vacant lots, there's small food producing sections in any type of housing. There's growing food on the patio of of a condo. I mean, there are all these opportunities to do that. Folks need to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that education piece is is really important. It it is, it is. And not only for the consumer, but probably for the grocery stores themselves. As I kind of close my eyes and walk through the grocery store, a lot of unhealth, un, unhealthy types of foods that exist there, right? Um, all the packaged goods and the, the processed goods, right? Uh, moving people away from the processed goods. And we're all guilty of it at some point in time. Uh, that's how we grew up oftentimes. But you mentioned culture change around this, and that's exactly what you know this is how do you teach people to eat the live foods as i like to say the fruits and the vegetables versus the canned meats and and all the other uh uh stuff and so it this is going to be a heck of a culture change for for not only this area but across this country given our food supplies and and how um what we have in the stores so well, we, you know, that really makes me think behavioral economics, mm. right? Like you mentioned earlier, you know what to do. You just don't always do it, right? right? right. Same for me, <laughs> right. same for every human. <laughs> right. We are wired to do what's easy. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that's been successful in a lot of communities is partnerships. Let's say we have a partnership with a grocery store and their end of that partnership is to put healthy items at the checkout. Mm-hmm. Seems pretty easy, right? Other communities have done it. It can happen. I remember uh, dealing with one particular uh, set of stores here locally to talk about that concept, and there was a barrier. Mm-hmm. And their barrier was the contracts that they had with the large vendors mm-hmm. for how things had to be placed. So, in the era of big data where computers can determine purchasing patterns. And Mm -hmm. we know that's been going on for quite some time going way back to the studies that showed that target based on purchasing patterns could determine when a woman was pregnant before she knew, Mm -hmm. you know, the big data is a real thing, right? People Mm -hmm. determine based on purchasing patterns and then contracts get spun out of that. Mm -hmm. So again, it has to be a process over time where we say, these are the factors that are important in our community. If you want to have the you know healthy seal of approval as a food vendor, mm-hmm. then there are certain patterns that we need to see happen. Mm-hmm. 
and then they're either interested or not, depending on their business model, right? And, you know, that's a process. That's a process because economics drive everything right. at the end of the day. Right. And so it, it, it's not necessarily something that can experience instant change. Right. But over time, that change that makes it where, you know, the healthy thing is right there where you put your hand when you're about to check out because you forgot something that over time really does begin to change things. Yes, that's right. You know, you, you just mentioned that economics drives everything from the choice that the consumer makes given their disposable income to the choice that the, the grocery store chain makes, right? To what products it sells within a particular store in a particular demographic. Uh, oftentimes when I'm in the grocery store, I notice that the healthiest foods are the most expensive foods. At least they appear that from a price perspective. But if you extrapolate that out and say, well, if in fact, if my f dietary regimen includes these things and they're healthier, then it's less, I'm less likely to have to go to see the doctor. So short term, it may seem expensive, but long term, it's not as expensive if I don't have to go to see the physician. So those that's the type of transformation that ha we have to kind of teach, if you will, you know, short term versus long term, what the, what the consequences could potentially be. If I'm eating uh, Mr. Good Bars and Snickers all the time versus a banana or an apple, then I'm probably going to have to see the dentist more than I would if I'm eating more apples. And so that mindset change, right? That, that filler, because sometimes we think filler is nutrition versus what actual nutrition is. Absolutely. And there are other policy things that we could work on as well. Right. So, you know, snap benefits, mm -hmm. you know, don't always make sense. For example, mm. somebody who, who has these food stamps can go, and buy two bags of potato chips, mm -hmm. that's covered, but they couldn't buy a rotisserie chicken. Mm -hmm. They're like, that's a head scratcher, right? It is, why is that, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. and it's another thing that's intention versus impact. Its origin was probably, it was in terms of prepared foods were disallowed mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, prepackaged, it, it counts as a prepackaged type thing. And so the original intent was good, those rules were written before there, you could go to Costco and get a rotisserie chicken, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Or go to any one of many grocery stores and get a rotisserie chicken, which would be much healthier mm -hmm. than those two bags of chips or that two liter drink or any one of another set of, of prepackaged foods that fall into a different bucket, right? Mm -hmm. And so policy change has a, has a lot to do with it. And people need to go back and do that intent impact analysis and say, this was designed to do this. It's missing these opportunities and is driving this. How can we change it? Yep, absolutely. Question in the status quo, right? Yeah, that, that's always, because uh, I've heard those stories uh, about being able to buy chips and not be able to buy rotisserie chicken. I'm like, how much sense does that make, right? Yeah, zero. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, <laughs> yeah, doesn't make, doesn't right. make any I mean, sense whatsoever, well, right? Some people might say, what the hell? Yeah, right? it, it, mean, it, exactly. And, and that's that's really where we are in terms of some of our our policies. But let's look at what it's driving, right? So right. recent study I read, actually several years old now, but still true. All the children born since 2000, if you look at our state, about a third of them will become diabetic. Mm. That sets them up for kidney failure, mm -hmm. heart disease, mm -hmm. strokes, mm -hmm. amputations. Mm -hmm. And then also if you look at minority populations, which in our state is predominantly uh, African-American, Hispanic, and Native American, mm -hmm. that rate is 50%. Mm -hmm. So... I, it makes me ask, why are we willing to continue to allow the status quo to drive these horrifying outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Because these are the people that are our friends, our neighbors, our family, our workforce, mm -hmm. the future of our state and country, mm -hmm. right? So why wouldn't we 
be a little bit more intentional about what we're creating, be a little bit more critical about what our policy has achieved Mm -hmm. versus what was intended Mm -hmm. and make some changes. Mm -hmm. We got to look, we got to look at doing business differently, right? Because we, we know behind all of this at the end of the day, it's probably a profit, right? For somebody. And for some, it's more intentional that, and it's more important that they make the profit versus the health of the person, right? If we know what the data says and we know that all of these health disparities are created given these conditions, why don't we change? Because it's probably a benefit to somebody, right? Whether that benefit is profit, whatever that benefit may be, right? Whether it's whether it's uh, the number of patients that I'm continuing to see on a year in and year out basis, right? There's a benefit to somebody to keep to keep the status quo where it is. But if this data says it's about health, then it, it would seem to me that the policies would come into play around the businesses that are that are that are uh, either providing us with healthy or non healthy foods. Um, and then it would appear that the status quo would want that that change as well because they're consumers too. They eat too. They have to eat healthy as well, right? So everybody's impacted. All the dots connect for a a, a more healthy uh, society and a society that chooses food to be its medicine. And it's really, to me, there was a good recent sign, and this would have been last week of September 2022, you saw really a big uh, think tank, governmental, federal governmental uh, think tank around what it really meant to consider food as, as medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that's a very uh, positive sign. Mm-hmm. And it's also a cautionary tale, mm-hmm. right? Because you can see, okay, all of a sudden there's this massive heightened awareness. Folks are going to start doing things and doing things differently right they're going to put initiatives in place to achieve well-intended things and then if we're not careful if we haven't carefully measured these things if we haven't used longitudinal tools like the healthy communities north carolina dashboard to see what happens you know we'll look back five or ten years from now and say wow we really missed it yeah right and we will likely find ourselves with the same food deserts or maybe slightly moved around, but no different in terms of the default future for 30 to 50% of the children that are being born. And that'd be a shame, right? That, that's where we always talk about it, Terry, but intent and impact are two different things. Yes. And we have to absolutely put a premium on the measurement of impact, right? It doesn't mean somebody had bad intentions, right? Whether you're talking about food hardship, whether you're talking about a lot of the racial construct of our society, what we're talking about is let's look at the impact and let's make adjustments to bring it back to what the good intent would have been. Yep, absolutely to include sustainability, because that's what we're really talking about. Once you have that good impact, right, how do you continue to sustain that by continuously reviewing the data, understanding the measurements, even changing the measurements as as situations change, right? That whole sustainability. But you mentioned longitudinal. Often, that is not where we look, right? We're looking three to five years versus let me see what the impact will be 20 years from now and the impact on the economics in the area, the people in the area, the education in the area, the health in the area. Uh, did, it in, did it improve uh, whatsoever? But oftentimes it's like short three to five years we had an impact so we're going to move on to something else. But there's nothing more important than the health of a human being because once you lose that health, you can't get it back. Absolutely. And we're looking at, you know, again, I think this underscores how Dr. Satcher is a genius, right? He really makes things simple, you know. Will you persevere? Mm-hmm. Right? So mm-hmm. we've done all these good things, these mm-hmm. well-intentioned mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. 
what does perseverance mean, right? Mm -hmm. Like we know what it means in certain contexts, right? Mm -hmm. If we're talking about, you know, an athletic endeavor is, mm -hmm. is play till the whistle, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. then when, the, when, the, when it starts back again, play till the whistle again, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. keep on, you know, it's mm -hmm. stick with it the whole time mm -hmm. until the clock runs out. You know, the difference in this environment is the clock never runs out. You can continue to That's always right. get better. That's right. Somehow we fooled ourselves into thinking that we're better, but many of the things that we're looking at in terms of societal level, simple things like food insecurity, like housing, like safe environments aren't much better. There's a quote, and I don't, can't remember who said it, but it might, may have been Einstein, said our best thoughts got us where we are, right? Our best policy developers, or the thoughts of the, our best policy developers, the thoughts of our best uh, leaders, be it local or, or, or organizational leaders, have us where we are. Um, a food desert should never exist as long as a human being is in that particular area, right? It should never exist. But it was to the, it was to the benefit of somebody, and we have to understand that. It was to the and it may not have been intentional, but it was to the benefit of someone, and people continue to ride whatever those benefits are. So um, we have to eradicate this. And when I think of perseverance, as you mentioned, Dr. Satcher, I connect perseverance to sustainability. Will you persevere? It means year in and year out. So for me, I equate that to sustainability. And we have to build systems that are sustainable, and especially around food, because we know the healthier that one eats, the healthier one is, more than likely, they're going to have healthier thoughts, right? They're going to they're going to they're, they're thinking a, a particular way. It, they'll be healthier from a physical perspective as well, right? Which is a benefit to the system from a cost perspective around insurance. So if we connect all the dots, and you live longer, right? So if we connect all the dots, I see nothing but win, win, win for a healthier, a healthier uh, workplace, a healthier population. Absolutely. Again, and I can geek out on this whole topic because, you know, a lot of the circles I right. run in are, are medical people, healthcare leadership. And, you know, we talk about this transition to value and how that really means that our reimbursement model ultimately shifts to keeping people healthy instead of being a medical repair right. shop, right. which is how I like in, right. in a regular audience, I like to talk in terms that make more sense than right some of the terminology we use. But right now, there's not an economic incentive to keep people healthy. Doesn't mean we don't believe it's important. We do. It just means that it's hard to achieve for us without a lot of partnerships, right? Because these things have to be created across communities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, community by community, and a lot of the factors are similar across communities, but many are also different. And having those partnerships and things to really begin to change that is important. But you go back to economics and what drives business, you cannot have huge business growth on a long-term basis without healthy, able workforces right. and people who are actually doing the day-to-day -day of whatever that business is. And so until we figure this out, until we are able to make that transition to creating health, our business prosperity is threatened. That's right. And so to me, it's a no brainer to figure it out a little bit better. It's a matter of connecting all the dots, right? Because all the dots to connect. And, and oftentimes we have a difficult time in our society connecting all the dots as to how a healthier workforce makes for hopefully lower insurance premiums, which means that, uh, that you know, there's more profitability to go around. Uh, that means a healthier society, kids are healthier. Uh, and so we get to that whole food is medicine and preventative care and, 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 and preventative care versus, as you call it, health care, right? Because if you had, if you had health, you wouldn't need care. <laughs> that's right. right yes that's right 
you know, and, and we know certain things from other experiences that are translatable, right? So this will be controversial, but it's been many years ago that as a health system, we began to require flu vaccination. Mm-hmm. And people can take an ideological perspective and say, you know, don't make me do anything. And we didn't. We just said, if you want to work for us and help keep people healthy, you need to get vaccinated so right. you don't infect them. Right. And, uh, you know, sort of fast forward that thing. One of the most interesting things that we found out is that during flu season, our staff was so much healthier, they had much less absenteeism mm-hmm. because they they had the flu shot. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean one or two people didn't get the flu. It takes us back to our whole truth episode, right? Like, mm-hmm. you, yeah, you can get the flu shot and get the flu. You can get COVID shot and still get COVID. Mm-hmm. It's not perfect. But across populations of people, the evidence is clear mm-hmm. that these are very positive things to do. And the same holds true with food, right? As we figure out how to get people better nutrition, starting with where they are, mm-hmm. you know, we can't, we can't start anywhere else but where we are right now, right? That's my right. next breath That's is right. going to be different than That's right. my last That's right. one, as That's you right. and I have talked. Um, but starting with where they are, figure out how to get people on a better, pl- a better track nutritionally, it's going to be a win across the whole population and for most of the individuals. That, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly uh, in, in the fact that we got to connect the dots. We have to be able to understand the benefits, right? Uh, and oftentimes companies don't understand until you put it in a dollar figure for them, right? But you just mentioned when you give them the flu shot at the hospital, how you noticed that there were more people who who didn't miss work. And as a result, I'm sure productivity numbers increased, right? And as a result of that, the, the organization itself was more effective from a healthcare perspective. And who would want to visit a healthcare institution where the employees of the healthcare system weren't healthy? They were sick. No one wants to do that, right? <laughs> right? And so it only makes it only makes sense. But you can really tie it to business outcomes of productivity and engagement uh, as a result of giving um, that that flu shot. So yeah, that 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 was a, a a great example of what it means to be healthier and be more productive. Uh, so. So how do we pull this food program together? You know, we've got, in our community, we've got so many agencies doing it. We have made significant improvements, you know, in, in even small populations, right? And we have created programs that now have translated across the entire stage of American healthcare. So we're at that sustainability point that you mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. How do we continue to measure these things, continue to, to assess mm-hmm. what the impact of, of our initiatives have been, what the impact of the bigger initiatives that should be rolling out across the entire country in the coming years are and move forward from that. I think it gets us back to that theme of unlikely intersections. Mm-hmm. Who would expect that in a big health system that registered dietitians would hold the key to so many things? Mm -hmm. But they did, and they do. And how do we find other experts that are hidden in plain sight? Mm -hmm. Gets us back to our theme about leadership. And what does leadership look like, not only for food, but for just bringing out the best in people that have a certain expertise that can make your entire product be better? Absolutely. And it also goes back to a question that I like, and I know when we first met, I kind of posed it to you, and that is, what if? What if we tapped into the expertise and the knowledge base of all the people around us? What solutions could be developed because now we're getting different perspectives right uh, and and it's inclusive perspectives right from everyone within the organization uh, that's always always very interesting what if what opportunities can we uh, create by including uh, everyone in the solution versus just a few 
it's truly where the magic happens. Yeah. It's been another great conversation for us, Terry, and I hope our audience has enjoyed it. You know, and can check us out at unlikelyintersections.com. Check me out on LinkedIn at Doc Philip Brown or Terry at. You can check me out on LinkedIn as well, Terry Jackson, PhD. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Dr. Brown, it's one that is truly needed, and uh, we need to do more to let food be our medicine. Absolutely. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Thank you.